Good afternoon, everyone. This is Bill Jacobs. I'm the program manager for the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. Welcome to today's webinar. All it takes is one boat stopping the spread of aquatic invaders. I'm joined by Abby Besrutsik, our field project and outreach coordinator, and Haley Gladich, our invasive species specialist. The three of us are LISMA's full-time staff. LISMA, for those of you who are new to us, is a voluntary association of land managers and landowners working together to prevent the spread of invasive species in the LISMA region, which is New York City, uh, Staten Island, Brooklyn and Queens in New York City, and all of Suffolk and Nassau counties. We're funded by the New York State Environmental Protection Fund under contract with the state DEC. So hi again, um, I'm just gonna go over some vocab that you might hear throughout this talk. Um, so we have native species which have evolved in a certain region over the course of hundreds of thousands of years. They help keep uh, balance in our ecosystems as they have organisms that they consume and organisms that consume them. They also provide services that keep ecosystems healthy, like water filtration and st shoreline stabilization. And I should mention that we also rely pretty heavily on these ecosystem services too, since filtered waters help keep the fish that we eat alive and stable shorelines help to reduce storm impacts. Um, there are non-native species as well. These are species that have been introduced either purposely or accidentally that have a neutral or even beneficial event on our uh, effect on our environment. Um, for example, many of our crops like non-natives are not our non-natives like tomatoes and cucumbers and they have benefit to us since we eat them. M lastly, we have invasive species, which is largely what we'll be talking about today. Um, they are non-native species, but they're ones that are disruptive to our ecosystems and they do so through a number of tactics like rapid spread, high reproduction and changing the physiology of an ecosystem in order to favor an invasive species own survival. Um, yeah, so with that, we say that invasive species are ones that are harmful. So they're harmful to our environment, our economy, and or our human health. Um, we have some examples here, such as up on top, the giant hogweed, which um, and we're gonna talk about more um, aquatic species today, but some terrestrial examples are, are giant hogweed, which have a phytophototoxic sap, which can cause burns that require medical treatment. Um, in the middle, we have the emerald ash borer, which threatens all ash trees in the US. They eat the vascular tissue of the trees. Um, and these were really some pr prominent trees in our forests at one point, and they provided important ecosystem services and habitat for birds and insects. And lastly, we have the Northern snakeheads, which are really weird um, obligate air breathing fish that can survive out of the water for up to four days and move around really easily to different water bodies that way. They displace and overconsume our commercially important fish as well as the fish, um, the those fish that those commercially important fish eat. Hello, this is Abby here. Um, so why should you care about this? Simply put, aquatic invaders can ruin some summer fun. They can be the difference between a summer of peak tourism and a ghost town. I know this personally when there was uh, a harmful algal bloom and other invasive species take over in a lake that I go to a lot and um, where there used to be a lot of people swimming, suddenly nobody could swim or even wants to swim around their dock. So that could really impact tourism. Also, it could impact uh, the difference between natural fish runs and clogged gear and waterways. You could have, um, you know, Phragmites common reed blocking a stream passage, and then you're not able to have um, the fish that you want to be fishing in the waterway that you normally frequent. It could also be the difference between an easygoing boat ride and a seized engine. Also, I've, I've had the experience of uh, pulling up my propeller in an outboard engine and it being clogged with Eurasian water milfoil. And that's just not the way I want to really be spending my day or even jumping in the water to pull out, you know, seaweed from uh, a jet ski. It's um, an interruption that really shouldn't, you shouldn't have to deal with. And also the difference between a relaxing paddle and strenuous exercise. If you've ever kayaked through water chestnut or other invasive species, you know what it feels like and uh, it's not so much fun. So we're gonna be talking about um, some aquatic invasive species. The 
There are many aquatic invaders to talk about. Here's some of them. There are probably hundreds that we could talk about. So, so we just picked some highlights, some examples for illustration. One very interesting invader is the snakehead. Snakeheads are air breathing freshwater fish that are uh, not native to North America. They, they may have been released by aquarium hobbyists or by people hoping to establish a local food source. Snakeheads are sold or were sold in live fish markets in New York City. And what they do is they compete with important native fish that share the same habitat. And this idea of competing with native species is uh, pretty universal throughout the invasive species world. They have a long, thin body, flattened eyes, look somewhat like a snake a little bit. And uh, yeah, they produce quickly and a lot, 28,000 to 115,000 eggs can be produced. Some of the plants that we have on Long Island are invasive. There's some of the aquatic plants we have. Water primrose, other, otherwise known scientifically as Ludwigia peploides, or we just call it Ludwigia. It's a freshwater floating perennial. It makes pretty, uh, pretty nice looking, I think, yellow flowers. It tends to float on the water and forms very dense mats that are very difficult or impossible to paddle through or get a boat through. They're found along shores of slow moving waters, including sections of the Peconic River. And we believe it was originally introduced as an ornamental or a water garden plant. We have native Ludwigia also. So this is the native lookalike. Water purse lane is the common name, Ludwigia palustris, found on the edges of lakes, ponds, streams, and also in vernal pools and swamps and marshes. Does well in the open, exposed, muddy edges as uh, water levels drop and then water uh, muddy edges are exposed. It does fairly well. Superficially, or uh, or from a distance, they look very much the same, the native one and the invasive one. So I would recommend if you see either of the Ludwigias or any Ludwigia, take photos, try to take a sample if you can and check with a botanist or you can uh, send photos to us at LISMA and we can help determine which one it is. So this is another really interesting um, aquatic species. It's a freshwater aquatic uh, carnivorous plant, and it's closely related to sundews and Venus flytraps. While there aren't any yet documented in New York, there are some found in Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. So this is one that we kind of consider um, our, an early detection species. We have our eyes really open for them. Um, they're, again, perennial, rootless, and free-floating plants. Um, and they have their leaves arranged in whorls along the stem. And those stems are filled with uh, air pockets. And on top, they are tipped with uh, lamina or traps. And those traps can catch up to 200 uh, you know, invertebrates, fish, tadpoles um, at a time. And about 80% of those traps at any given time might be filled with those, those species. And this gives scientists a really great concern about water whales effect on the food webs and the rare invertebrate species um, that are found in its introduced range that it might be feeding on. Um, it's also a great concern for us on Long Island, since Long Island has acidic freshwaters, which water real, really particularly likes. And this plant was introduced in sort of a crazy way. Um, so basically, there was a bunch of carnivorous plant people who were really excited about this plant, and they brought it over from China. Um, and they just wanted them, you know, in their special carnivorous plant gardens and their aquariums. Um, and one guy in particular was really interested in it, and he found like he mapped all of these places along Virginia where he thought it would do really well and grow. And so he planted them really painstakingly. And on his journey, he went all the way up to New Jersey, stopped at a friend's house and dumped out the rest out of his truck and to the stream water body behind his friend's house. The following year he returned and he went all the way looking through his plants in Virginia and was super bummed because all of them died. 
Um, and all of his best efforts were kind of lost. And he got back to his friend's house in New Jersey at the end of his trip again, was kind of like, oh man, like my plants all died, but took a look out back and found his water wheel growing there like really abundantly. So it's kind of um, a cautionary tale of no matter how hard we try to get our ornamental plants to grow in our backyard and they might not seem to be doing well, they might be doing well somewhere else because oftentimes plants have different plans than we do. Um, and it also kind of has some nuance because this plant in its native range is extremely rare, um, but unfortunately we're finding it here um, and potentially doing damage. So we're trying to figure out ways, how can we conserve it maybe in these other places, but also try to reduce its impacts um, here in the United States. And here's just a cool video of it eating some mosquito larvae. Awesome. And I should mention, um, Steve Pearson just pointed out there is one population in New York, but there are none yet in um, the Lisma region. Thanks, Steve. This one is Hydrilla. This is another aquatic invasive species that forms dense populations that crowd out native species and crowd out recreational uses. We have several infestations already on Long Island. We're trying to survey and, and locate water bodies that don't have hydrilla and some of the other aquatic invasives so that we can protect those. It's a submersed freshwater aquatic plant. This has five leaves per whorl. The leaves are serrated. The tubers that you see in the lower center there, if, those, if the plant is broken and those float away, they'll form new plants. So they, it, again, it crowds out native species, impedes boating, swimming, irrigation in places where they have irrigation ponds. There are some lookalikes, one in particular, which is a native, our native Elodia canadensis. They're fairly easy to tell apart because of the number of leaves. The Elodia leaves typically occur in whorls of no more than three and they appear to be smooth edged. If you look with a magnifying glass, you might see, notice a little serrated edge, but from the, with uh, the naked eye, it looks like they have a smooth edge. So the invasive hydrilla has more leaves. It's more invasive. That's how I keep it straight. And the native one has three leaves. We also have another invader. This looks somewhat like the, that one is Brazilian waterweed, Agaria densa, which also has finely serrated leaves. The growth form, as you can see, the way the leaves are laid out there is a little different. And these come in whorls of three to six, generally, Brazilian waterweed. We have this one too. Um, so yeah, so another kind of crazy story. Um, there was this kind of weird connection between hydrilla and bald eagles that was recently discovered where they were finding in particular first these eagles that were losing control over their bodies. They were developing holes in their brains and sort of becoming zombie eagles. Um, and they noticed the herbivorous prey also kind of having the same effect. So they started going down the food chain a little bit and they noticed that on the hydrilla, there was a cyanobacterium growing on it that was producing a neurotoxin um, and this neurotoxin was affecting the, um, you know, it was, it was being eaten um, from the hydrilla into these uh, coots, these herbivorous water animals um, and birds, and they were then being consumed by the bald eagles. Um, so it was giving these birds, um, both the coots and the eagles, a disease called uh, vacuolar myelinopathy or VM. And yeah, basically this biotoxin is accumulating in the coots um, and the bald eagles and yeah, just killing them. So it's a really scary story for the, you know, these birds that we care a lot about. And it's a pretty good reason to get rid of the hydrilla that we have. Well, 
Now we'd like to welcome Ashley Morris from the DEC to talk about the Boat Steward Program. Hi, uh, I'm Ashley Morris. Um, let me share my screen. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator for Long Island. Um, sorry, as always, technology is just wonderful. Okay, that's full screen now, right? Yes. Yeah. Lovely. Okay. Um, so I help manage the aquatic invasive species on Long Island. Um, I work more on the state side of things. Uh, we're going to start out. Uh, we've seen this guy before. Um, this is once again that Ludwigia peploides um, that was mentioned earlier. Uh, this is what it's like in the Peconic in the late summer. Um, so one of the things that we try to focus on uh, with the boat stewarding program is really helping educate people about um, what they can do on a daily basis as boaters and um, as fisher people, people that fish, um, what they can do to help prevent the spread of invasive species. Because uh, like we see with the Ludwigia here, once an invasive species really takes hold into a water body, it can completely take over. It, this is a very popular boating spot, but because of Ludwigia, it's very, very difficult to boat. Um, and then this particular species is extremely difficult to manage. Um, it costs a lot of money. It, it reproduces by fragmentation. So little pieces of this plant can make whole new plants. Um, and so pulling it out of the water isn't very effective. Um, and so because of that, one of the best ways to help manage these plants is to make sure that they never get into the water body in the first place. Um, and how the boat stewards try to help with that is they try to manage situations like this um, from happening. So this is a boat trailer um, that is just completely covered with various aquatic plants. Uh, when they back the trailers into the water to let their boats off, uh, this can happen a lot, especially later into the summer. They'll pull it, their trailer back out and it'll be completely covered um, in these aquatic plants. And what we do with our boat stewarding program is we have um, individuals at certain boat launches, um, they talk to the boaters about what they do to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. And then we also help educate them uh, to ensure that when this person leaves our boat launch, they don't immediately go to a different water body and put whatever is on this trailer um, into another water body that may not have those invasives. Um, and in this way, it can really, it's a little thing that uh, people can individually do that really saves us a lot of trouble down the line um, from managing all these invasive species. Um, and so what we try to tell people to do uh, is clean, drain, and dry your boat. Uh, it's a really, you know, three steps, pretty simple process um, on Long Island, we don't have any boat launches that are equipped with uh, boat washing equipment. And so what we do ask people to do is take that vegetation like you saw on that trailer off. Uh, if we have a boat steward at a location, the boat steward can help you do that. Um, but take all those plants off and put them out to dry far away from uh, the water body. A lot of places have a little designated area with a sign uh, that kind of looks like this that tells you that you can put the plants there and that way they dry out and die away uh, from the water. And so it doesn't recontaminate the water because that would be not great. Um, but then we also highly recommend people take their boats to places like car washes or you know, back home if you have a hose in your yard and then you completely wash that boat down um, in all of its areas. So like if it has a live well to you know, drain that out and wash it with you know, soap and water or diluted bleach also works very well uh, to kill any you know, little organisms because things like zebra mussels um, can be really, really hard to detect with the naked eye. But if you're very vigilant about cleaning the boat, that helps a lot. Um, something else that is extremely helpful is draining your boat out completely. So again, the live well, the transom well, everything has to be drained. Um, so that the boat is dry on the inside and then you can dry it with a towel if you're a frequent boater and you're going to go out like the next day it's good to dry it completely off with a towel or something. Um, leaving it out to dry in the sun is also very effective. Um, it's most common that you'll see pictures like this where we have like a, a motor boat but it's also extremely important especially here 
Um, with a lot of our boat launches, we see a lot of recreational boaters that are using kayaks and canoes. Um, those boats don't really go on trailers very often, but it's still really, really important to still do that cleaning, draining, and drying, um, especially with kayaks. Draining and drying can be something that I notice people get a little lazier about, but um, it's really, really important to kind of uh, stay vigilant with that. We also um, have an extra reminder on this particular sign um, to not release uh, plants or fish into a body of water. If you're tired of the goldfish that you have, it's so much better, both for the goldfish and for the water body, to have someone you know, find a, a better home for it with another person um, and not release it into the Peconic River or into Lake Ronkonkoma, which are our local water bodies or any other local water body um, because they can be really huge problems there. We've had a lot of fishing surveys where we see goldfish in, um, in streams and ponds. Uh, and they are really good competitors and they can outcompete out native species of fish. Um, and it's really strange when you go fishing to hook a, hook a goldfish. Uh, we are really trying to avoid that. Um, and a lot of uh, aquatic plant species have also been uh, tracked to aquarium dumps. Um, don't clean your aquarium in the river. <laughs> Don't dump your aquarium out in the river. Uh, you can treat aquarium water and aquarium waste very similarly to how we're asking people to treat boats. Uh, you can remove all that vegetation far away from any water body source, let it dry out and throw it away properly, you know, drain the aquarium out and dry it before you do anything else with it. Uh, but we do ask that that is also disposed of uh, in a very similar way. Um, so in New York, with our boat stewarding program, we have all of these locations that either have a boat steward on them or have a decon station. Um, and so if this is something that you're interested in and you're located somewhere in New York and you know, you're know you an avid boater, maybe you've already run into them, but if you would like to um, talk to one of our boat stewards or start boating in areas where um, you can be sure that there's someone that can help you with this sort of process, the, on the DEC website, we have a map um, of all our locations that have uh, boat stewards at them currently. We have quite a few locations um, on Long Island uh, where, where uh, I'm located. We have a couple of boat stewards uh, and we're expanding to marine boat launches as well. Um, so that's something really neat to check out if people want to check it out. Um, and just to finish up, I kind of want to show how this process works. So on the right, uh, you see the boat stewards and their cool little vests that reminds people of what they're supposed to do. Um, inspecting the boats, we inspect when people launch and when people retrieve um, their boats, uh, just to really get them on both sides because we don't want people launching into the water body taking something from somewhere else and we don't want them leaving our water body potentially taking that invader to another spot. Um, and then on the left here uh, is one of the boat launches that we on Long Island have a boat steward at. Um, you see we have the signage um, and we do, it is also a really nice way to kind of engage with boaters and you can ask them questions about the types of fish that are in the water and stuff like that. Um, so it is, a, it is a nice way that we're trying to both steward the water body itself and prevent aquatic invasive species before they get problematic in these areas. That's all I have. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks so much. And at the end, there will be an opportunity for folks to ask questions of uh, Ashley or any one of us. This is my slide, thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, Ashley did a great job of talking about ways that um, ways to, that cleaning your boat is important and ways that aquatic invasive species are spread. We came up with uh, four Bs for um, talking about how aquatic invasive species are spread, ballast, boat, bait, and business. So um, we're just going to a little bit more detail about some of those to wrap up this presentation. One of the ways that many invasive species have traveled to New York 
city in Long Island in particular is through shipping. And ships have been coming into New York Harbor since at least the 1600s. And throughout those centuries or decades, uh, the ships have been loading and unloading. Oftentimes they carry ballast water that keeps the boat centered upright. So they'll fill up the uh, part of the hull of the boat with water. And then when they reach their port, they may dump the water and then put in new water. But what happens is all the plants, all the animals, all the seeds that are in the water from their home port get dumped in uh, New York Harbor, New York City and around Long Island. So many, many plants and animals have traveled that way through shipping. There are laws today to counteract that, that uh, ships need to exchange their ballast water out at sea, not wait until they get into the port. So they do it out at sea where it's uh, probably a lot safer that way as far as the spread of invasive species. But that, and also the shipping material as well inside the ships, crates, cartons, uh, things like that. So shipping has been a big transportation avenue, pathway. Uh, one example in particular of um, ballast water moving invasive species is the zebra mussel. And while these aren't yet on Long Island, it's another species we really hope people can have a, have a watchful eye for. Um, there are these extremely fertile mussels that release up to 5 million eggs per year, a single individual can. Um, they attach themselves to native mollusks and prevent their feeding and growth. They also overconsume phytoplankton and outcompete zooplankton, which majorly disrupts our pre-existing food webs and does damage to our commercial fishing industry and overfilters our water. Um, aside from the damage that's done to the water physiology and ecology, they do massive damage to our underwater pipes by increasing sedimentation, corrosion, and they can even stop water flow. All of this is extremely costly to repair. And uh, as you've already guessed by coming to this presentation that boats are a great way that aquatic invasive species spread, um, not only through transporting them to and from water bodies, but also the propellers breaking up um, invasive species can help their spread as a number of aquatic plants can reproduce by tiny fragments. Um, aquatic invertebrates can attach themselves to nearly any surface of a watercraft, and also larvae can survive in small amounts of standing water that has been left on boat surfaces. As Ashley had mentioned, bait is one of uh, these other huge ways that invasive species can get moved around. Um, some live bait can be promoted for catching specific fish, but they might be non-natives, which can easily become an issue if they are accidentally re released from our lines or are dumped from bait buckets that are no longer needed. For example, these are rusty crayfish, which were used to catch smallmouth bass. And while they're native through the Ohio River Basin and in the states of Ohio and Kentucky, um, rusty crayfish are able to spread into our northern lakes and streams where they cause a variety of ecological problems. They displace native crayfish from their habitats and our native fish actually avoid rusty crayfish because they're really defensive and have much larger claws than our, na claws than our native crayfish. And they cause um, these native fish to overfeed on the native crayfish. So it's kind of this like indirect stress that they're creating. Um, and again, as Ashley said, unused bait fish, whether it's purchased or collected needs to be disposed of um, far away on the land or in the trash and not in the water. Um, so if you're collecting bait fish from the water that you're fishing in, definitely only use it in those same waters. And our last B is business. So kind of a bit more broader than boating and fishing, but um, oftentimes the pets that we own um, are not native to the places that, they're, that we live in. For example, red-eared sliders are an extremely common pet store turtle that was actually widely introduced to our ecosystems. They were this huge fad pet in the early 2000s because of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, believe it or not. So a lot of kids got them as presents um, without their parents really realizing the longevity and care that goes into these animals that can live up to about 80 years old. Um, and so when parents and kids, but mostly I'm sure the parents are no longer able to care for these pets anymore, they quote unquote humanely introduce them to the ecosystems, um, you know, release them into nearby ponds. 
Um, but quite honestly, it's not that humane when you consider the effects that they have on the ecosystem. They can carry diseases that infect our native turtles, think like box turtles, terrapins, these really beautiful and important turtles to our ecosystems. And they also displace them from basking habitats, which turtles need to bask out in the sun in order to regulate their body temperatures. Um, and with that, you know, if you're thinking you're dumping your turtle terrarium, your fish terrarium, um, again, those goldfish that we see in those waters, they're super exotic and invasive. Um, but also the plants that are in those tanks can be really invasive as well. We have hydrilla, cabamba, there's plenty of them that started out, got their start in aquarium tanks and are now everywhere. Um, people also love a water interest in their yard. Think like a, a wet area, a pond, um, but they often include plants that are really cool and exotic, not native. And because these plants are highly adapted to a water lifestyle, they have seeds and especially roots that are easily transported to natural bodies of water. And one last bit about business is that something I learned recently was that exotic pet dealers might also purposely release exotic animals into the wild in order to establish breeding populations that they don't necessarily need to care for or provide resources for. So it's a bit cheaper for them, but you know they don't go back out and they might not catch all of those, you know, those exotic animals that they've initially released as they might've exploded in population size. So some things to think about when you're buying pets or plants. So you might be sitting here thinking, all right, why should I care? And I can sit here and tell you that inv invasive species look ugly, they make fishing and boating difficult, they disrupt local ecology or ecosystems, and you might care, but you might also think, all right, like I, I can get by that. But let me give you some figures. First, we talked about the zebra mussel a little bit, and the zebra mussel alone is estimated to cost the US $3.1 billion over the next 10 years, which is really just a lowball estimate. Um, again, it's not yet in New York, but already found in other New York regions. And that's just one high profile aquatic invasive species. So consider the current and potential impacts of the number of other invasive species we already have. Again, recent global studies have found that invasive species, terrestrial and aquatic, cost a minimum of $35 billion a year in North America. And that's not even including the health costs um, that they uh, cause us. So you can think like, like not an aquatic necessarily, but Lone Star ticks are hugely important to human health. They're highly impacting us. They carry diseases like starry, and we really don't want to get those. Um, and we have uh, overall economic contribution um, of the sport fishing, commercial fishing, and seafood industries in New York State is estimated about 11.5 billion. The loss of this industry would be really devastating since invasive species threaten about 42% of our native species. This includes our important commercial fish. Um, and not just those fish, but the fish they consume and the plants that those fish consume. So it's not just those that direct um, impact that invasive species are having, it's all the indirect packs up, impacts up the food chain. Um, I'm sure you can think of someone that you might know, a friend or a family member, maybe even yourself, who rely, relies directly on the fishing industry. Um, invasive species also impact our property values. One study found that um, properties that have Eurasian water milfoil um, their lakefront properties have decreased in, in value as much as 19%, which is not, not nothing. It's pretty, that's, that's a pretty big number. Um, and lastly, we're no stranger on Long Island to tropical storms, and these events are only getting stronger and more frequent. Many invasive species that grow along the store, shores reduce the stability of those shorelines by having weaker rooting systems than the native plants. And those invasive species actually benefit from having weak rooting systems so that their root fragments can move further down the stream and you know, create new populations. So having healthy shorelines is really important to us to reduce storm surges, which protect our homes and families. You, know, you can think back to Hurricane Sandy, which alone cost us $40 billion. And that there was $9 billion within that was just for mitigating for future storms. So, you know, the bottom line is invasive species are really expensive and it's important to keep in mind how we can protect our water bodies and shores before they're gone and we're left paying the bill. So, okay. oh, go ahead. <laughs> what can you do? What, what can, can we you all do? do? <laughs> A big issue on Long Island is nutrient loading in our ponds, lakes, rivers, and also in our bays. And nutrients, adding nutrients to water is exactly like fertilizing your lawn. When you fertilize your lawn, you have a nice bright green thick lawn. 
Well, if you take those same nutrients and pour them into the pond or lake in your neighborhood, you'll have a nice thick green patch of invasive plants. Even the native plants will grow more aggressively once you fertilize them. So one of the ways to minimize damage from invasive species is to reduce nutrient loading. And sources of nutrients on Long Island include lawn and agricultural fertilizers. I know there's been a lot of work lately by various groups to uh, control agricultural runoff and fertilizer use. There are phosphorus-free fertilizers that homeowners can use that work just as well on lawns, but they, the, without the phosphor, it, phosphorus, it tends to not damage waterways. Septic systems is a huge problem. We have houses built right up to the edges of some of our waterways with ancient septic systems that haven't been updated or cleaned in years, and that flows right into the waterways and feeds the invasive plants. Animal waste could be dogs, geese. Uh, we, we have these Long Islanders, we love these big lawns with pets and geese on them. And that animal waste also runs down into the lake or pond, feeding the plants. Any kind of surface and stormwater runoff uh, can fertilize our waterways, also wastewater treatment facilities, and there's atmospheric deposition as well, uh, different kinds of air pollution that affect our waterways as well. So not directly attacking the invasive plants themselves, but creating uh, healthy waterways that aren't over fertilized helps to uh, keep them at bay a little bit. I wanted to add that even being more aware of your place in the watershed or your local um, ecology can help too. I, I took a, I went out and took this picture um, right on the corner of my street uh, at the stormwater drain. And I live in West Hempstead. I don't consider myself being particularly near to the bay at all. I'm kind of right in the middle of the island. But um, being aware that you know my stormwater drains to the bay um, just reminds you that it everything's uh, really connected. So the things that you do in your yard can have impacts down the line and um, just really important to be aware of. Absolutely. So Ashley already did a great job of talking about cleaning and draining and drying your boat. Um, it's about the things that you see, but also what you don't see like microscopic larvae and invertebrates and, um, and also being keeping in mind to clean your trailer. It's also important to dispose of bait properly, um, disposing of unwanted bait, worms and fish parts in the trash. I also wanted to mention that um, worms in particular, you don't wanna just put those in a compost pile because we have invasive worms like jumping worm that are um, taking over and really impacting forests and eating up the organic layer of the forest floor. So disposing of those properly is super important. You never wanna dump live fish or other organisms and um, to drain live bait containers and replace with spring or dechlorinated tap water. It's just really great ethical ways to be enjoying fishing, but also making sure you're not having any unintended consequences. And don't be this guy. Don't release your pets, plants, or animals into natural <laughs> don't areas. That don't be that guy. Um, you're not helping anybody. And even uh, you actually mentioned bring, bringing your fish to a, a better home. Sometimes even pet stores will take your fish back. Uh, I had to do that once because I was not a great fish caretaker, but the pet store took it back and <laughs> um, happily, uh, and the fish went to uh, a better place. You also want to keep an eye on what you buy. You can buy anything on the internet, unfortunately, but that doesn't mean that you maybe should necessarily have that in your water garden in your backyard or um, have that in your fish tank. So buying native plants and non-invasive plants for landscaping and gardening uh, is really great to, great to do. Even last year, zebra mussels were found in moss balls that were for sale in aquarium stores, which were later recalled, but it, it made a big scare um, knowing that was something that you could buy and had those zebra mussels attached um, is, uh, is kind of scary. So you really should be careful about what you're bringing into your yard or your fish tank. So do your research or you could always ask us about it. 
And lastly, prevention and early detection is really key to this whole puzzle. If you remember anything else from this presentation, remember this. That's what saves us the money down the line, saves everybody money down the line, and um, protects the ecology and keeps our recreation as fun as possible. Yeah, if I, I, if I can add to that. Yeah. A lot of times, by the time Lisma gets that phone call from a local elected official or a homeowner, and they say, help, help, our lake is completely full of invasive aquatic plants. We used to swim in it, we used to boat in it, we can't do anything anymore. That phone call is pretty late. It, it's kind of too late. But we want to hear phone calls when a new invasive starts to pop up in a new place that's not badly infested yet. There's much more of a chance that you can uh, protect or restore a water body if the invasives are not very well established. If they are very well established, there's still things you can do to suppress them and contain them. And uh, that kind of maintenance probably has to go on forever once they're invested to, to some degree. So mm -hmm. preventing the establishment of invasives and getting them early is really important, critical. Definitely. And also that includes suppressing invasives at a water body so they don't get into another water body. For example, the Ludwigia in the uh, Peconic River, it, it can be suppressed, contained, and uh, with the boat stewards and other efforts. And then we keep an eye on other nearby rivers like the Carmen's River and uh, Connectquat and, uh, and keep serving those every year and make sure that the plants aren't jumping across to new water bodies. So what we do at LISMA, and we rely on volunteers a lot to do this, citizen scientists or community scientists, is we survey for new infestations. And we have a busy field season scheduled. We've already started surveying uh, water bodies throughout Long Island. LISMA has worked with the DEC and other partners to prioritize more than 700 water bodies on Long Island. And uh, we're also thinking of adding vernal ponds, which we don't have in the original list, but we prioritize 700 water bodies based on whether or not they have uh, rare or endangered species or communities, what their recreational value is, what their condition is. For example, are they already badly invaded or, or are they just mildly invaded or not invaded at all? So we prioritize 700 water bodies and we're going, the highest priorities, the highest priority water bodies tend to be those that are not badly invaded. Natural heritage communities like uh, coastal plain ponds, for example, and high recreational use areas, whether there's a uh, boating access, fishing, kayaking, things like that. We use several apps to help us with surveying. We use IMAP invasives quite a lot. And that is a, critically important database for uh, resource managers to keep track of invasions over the years and keep track of management, how the invasive species have been managed over the years. So that database is very important. Professionals use the database. Citizen scientists can use the database as well. And we have uh, LISMA offers training in IMAP invasives. It's a free app for smartphones. So if anyone's interested, get in touch with us and we'll uh, work on a way of getting you trained in IMAP invasives. There's also iNaturalist, which is also a free app. They're both free. This is a smartphone app that you can get from your uh, Google Play Store or whichever Play Store you have. It's free. You register. You just take pictures of any plant or animal that you see outside. And iNaturalist will help you identify it and you can keep track of all the observations you've made, like a, a running diary of the species you've observed. If you don't know what a species is that you're looking at, iNaturalist will help you identify it. And there are also community members that, that help people identify plants and animals that they see also. It's a really cool app. And there's a similar app that iNaturalist has, often popular with younger people, people under 13, kids, called Seek. Uh, Seek is simpler. It's very similar to iNaturalist, but you simply uh, 
create a video of, of the plant or animal or bird. You just aim your phone at it and the seek will identify whatever you're looking at. It's very cool. We're also using SAS Pro, which is Simple Aquatic Survey. So we have these priority water bodies that I mentioned. We're going to try to get out to as many as we can this season using a rake toss method. There's an image there of a rake. It's, it's basically a two-headed garden rake that you make. You throw it into the water and see what you pull up and identify it. And then we have the app SAS that keeps track of everything we observe, whether it's native plants or invasive aquatic species. This, if you are very interested or if you have a say a, a friends group or a, a nature society or a community organization around a water body, especially if it's one of our priority water bodies, we'd be willing to train uh, some volunteers in rake tosses and, and how to use the SAS and how to identify some of the invasives. So we can provide training in that as well. We also wanted to mention this is New York Invasive Species Awareness Week. You probably know that if you're here, but we have other events happening on Long Island coming up um, in celebration of this awesome week. Tomorrow, there's a water chestnut pull at Wontaw Mill Pond with uh, the DEC. That's in Nassau County. And so we'd love to see you there. There's a lot to pull and uh, many hands makes it possible. Um, there's also other events happening after NISA, but are still important to mention. Um, there's one, there's a plant ID hike with the North Shore Land Alliance, and also coming up in June and at the end of June is a bio blitz. So with the bio blitz, you're able to um, use iNaturalist, as Bill was talking about, to survey um, both native species and invasive species, particularly on the coast of Long Island. And so we're working on that with a few partners like the Long Island Sound Study, um, kind of guestuary partnership and um, South, South Shore, Shore Estuary Reserve. South Shore Estuary Reserve, yeah. CTUC, Environmental CTUC. Association, CTUC. So lots of people involved and we'd love to have you be a part of it to be um, making observations of native and invasive species that are all around the island uh, which helps to advance conservation, helps us to know what's out there. So keep an eye out for that. And to join the Coastal Vial Blitz, which I encourage all of you to do, it's very important. We do use this information. We collect information on native species as well as invasive species. If you download iNaturalist to your phone, there's also a desktop version, so you can go to iNaturalist and register. You just give them your email address and you make up a password. You can do that either on the desktop or on your cell phone. The Coastal Bio Blitz, once you're on iNaturalist with your phone, search for projects. It's called LI Coastal Bio Blitz. So search for LI Coastal Bio Blitz and join it. There's usually a join button somewhere on there. So if you join the project, all the species you observe between June 27th and July 3rd will be recorded and it would be hugely helpful. And if you have trouble with it, get in touch with us. We'll give you our email coming up. Oh, there's yeah. an email there for Abby. Yep. And it's it should be fun. There should be prizes too. So uh, be involved. It's a kind of a fun competition and a great thing for the whole family, really. And thank you. That's the end of our presentation. So, and we have time for presentations. And I th think it's not a huge crowd. So we could probably unmute and ask questions that way, or you can put your questions in the chat. I'm not sure which would be better, but uh, we'll check the chat too, if you wanna to just type in a question there. I have a question then, and then you, you can put the answer in the chat. How many of you, and I think we ha might have some idea, but I just wanna double check. How many people have used iNaturalist before? And say yes in the chat. And then if you haven't used it, would you like to try it out? Are you interested in trying it out? And then you could say interested or something, or we'll try. Yeah, we have a yes there. 
It's great. Uh, great program. And Seek, too. Both of them are, are really great. All right, any other questions, comments, last call? There's our email address, lismaprism at gmail.com. If you're interested in the BioBlitz, if you're interested in aquatic surveys or anything else, any questions, give us an email. If you send it to lismaprism at gmail.com, it will reach all three of us. And we can reach Ashley too, so. Um. Oh, there's a question. <laughs> Yeah, about the, um, we haven't actually gotten them out there yet. So the um, boat steward program just started uh, Memorial Day. Uh, and so we're training them at the freshwater launches because that's what we're most familiar with. Um, and later in the summer, we'll be expanding um, to marine boaters. I'm hoping that it's going to be um, a positive reception there. Uh, the marine launches are probably going to be more educational and less actual removals um, just because a lot of the places you don't you don't see quite the thick dense mats of uh, plants that you see in in freshwater so we're hoping to just kind of get out there and make sure that people are aware of the marine invasives we have some pamphlets to hand out but um, that's going to be a later in the summer project thanks Ashley And is there another question? No, that's it. Any other questions? I guess that's it then. So I want to thank you all for coming. Tomorrow's Friday. It's supposed to stay cool, relatively speaking. So have a wonderful weekend.